guys, Flickers of Fear time. And, uh, you know, just as I mentioned on a couple of my last videos, I decided that in the month of December, I was going to do a bunch of horror movies that were either Christmas adjacent or kind of Christmas horror movies, or at least one that was sent, set in the winter time. The thing about it is that I know there's like a shit ton of Christmas horror movies, but... We've covered a lot of them prior, like we already did Black Christmas, we already did kind of like the heavy hitter ones, and a lot of the other ones are like so shitty that I'm not really even sure that I want to waste my time on it, so I don't want to limit myself to just Christmas horror movies, so I'm going to do like ones that are just set in the winter time, uh, just like I did with Dead of, Dead of Winter, which again, not Christmas, but same kind of thing. Now, this movie here was one, again, this was one that I had never heard of prior, it came out in 2008, and it's called The Children. It's a British film. Now, don't confuse it with, uh, there was actually kind of a, uh, another like killer kid type of movie that came out back in 1980 that was also called The Children, although I think that has subsequently been retitled. I think it's called The Children of Ravensbeck or something like that. And I've actually seen that and it's not great. Um, it's okay, <laughs> but you know, but this is like a completely different movie. It is Killer Kids, so it does have a similar setup and a similar premise, but it's much, much better in quality, I have to say. So I first heard about this on one of those lists of, you know, best horror movies you've never seen, blah, blah, blah. Because like I said, honestly, this even got a limited theatrical release in the UK, didn't really do all that great, and so was never released in the US, uh, you know, to theaters or anything. So I kind of feel like this was one that flew under the radar, and that's really a shame because this is an excellent killer kids movie and it's an excellent sort of Christmas adjacent type of movie. It was directed by uh, Tom Shankland. Now he's made a handful of films. Uh, this, you know, this is one of his, I think he's only made like one or two after this one. He's actually more known for TV. Like he's done a lot of British TV. He's done some episodes of Ripper Street and he's done some American TV as well. He's done some uh, some Marvel stuff like Iron Fist and The Punisher. And um, I think he did some episodes of House of Cards as well. So that's kind of where most of his, uh, most of his expertise lies. But uh, as I said, it's kind of sad that he hasn't made like more movies because this is a pretty goddamn great killer kid movie and one that because I kind of feel like when you do killer kid movies one sometimes you know particularly American filmmakers I feel like and this is a generalization obviously because there are exceptions but I do kind of feel like they maybe shy away from showing violence toward children uh this one not so much uh this one pretty much goes for it um, and also, this one doesn't really have any kind of, it doesn't really have any black humor to it. And it's not, I mean, it's a pretty serious, grim situation. And as I said, it doesn't really shy away from violence, either, you know, the kids doing violence to the adults or the adults having to fight back and, you know, kill the kids to basically keep, to, to save themselves. So if that, if that sounds like something's going to bother you, because the kids are pretty cute and they're like realistic and everything, but this is going to make you as cute as the kids are and as arguably not really their fault it is, you're still gonna be like, yeah, fuck that kid, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like really good birth control this movie is too. And, it's, and even before they start like, you know, even before they start killing people, so many of them is just, you know, really overwhelming and you're just kind of like, oh my God, it's like, I can't even. So what we have, this is, it's not set on Christmas. I, my understanding was, that this was kind of like a Boxing Day to New Year's type situation because I kind of feel like maybe there's this one family and they had their own Christmas at home and now they're coming to, you know, the extended family to celebrate Boxing Day, New Year's. They're going to stay for a week or whatever. So that's kind of what I uh, got from it. So the family that's coming there is her mom, Elaine, and she has a, Elaine's husband, Jonah. And Elaine and Jonah have two younger kids, like little kids, Miranda and Polly. I think Miranda looks like she's about maybe five or six. Polly looks maybe about four or five, something like that. Now, Elaine also has an older teenage daughter named Casey, who is just kind of over this shit. Um, you know what I mean? The great thing about this is that the characterization in this is really good. Like all the actors are very naturalistic. Um, you can really get a sense of 
these are actual family members. Um, you know, the way they interact with one another is just very, you know, I think I said this in one other movie review or a book review that I was doing, but the interactions between them are very organic. So I don't really know a lot about the production of this movie, but it does kind of feel like one of those situations where they put all the actors together and said, it's like, you know, you guys are an extended family. And then just they had to kind of improvise everything because that's a very, very natural uh, interactions between them. So it's very, very easy to believe that these are two actual like family units and the way they're interacting with one another. So as I said, Casey, she's probably like 16, I guess something around there, 15, 16 years old. And she's kind of, you know, a rebellious uh, kind of teen. So she apparently was Elaine's daughter before, because I think it's uh, mentioned at some point, just kind of like a throwaway line, that Elaine was pregnant when she was a teenager. So she had Casey when she was very young, and then subsequently she's married this other guy, Jonah, and they have had two children together. So there's kind of that whole dynamic. Now they arrive at this very remote, uh, you know, it's very beautiful and very snowy, at this very remote uh, kind of really nice country house type situation, uh, which is owned by Elaine's sister, Chloe, Chloe's husband, Robbie, and they also have two little kids, Nikki and Leah. Now, Nikki is um, kind of, he's probably seven, eight, I don't know. It's really hard for me to tell uh, how old kids are. And Leah is probably, like I said, five or six. I think I said earlier that Miranda was younger than she was. Miranda actually looks like she's more like eight or nine. She looks like a little bit older. Like I said, I kind of got the names confused because there's a lot of, there's a gaggle. There's a gaggle of children in this movie. And um, so, it, so after a time, they just become kind of this, you know, force or whatever. So they've showed up, they've got Christmas presents. They're all like, they haven't seen each other in a long time. It's this big, you know, fun thing. Now, the first thing that's a little bit off that happens is that uh, one of the little kids, Polly, who's, as I said, probably like four or five, something like that. Uh, he gets out of the car, and before they even go in the house, he starts kind of throwing up. Now, they obviously, you know, it's a kid. They get sick all the time, so no one's really all that concerned about, oh, he must just be car sick, or he's got a bug or something like that. No biggie. You know, he's fine. They all go in the house and proceed to kind of, kind of just kind of hang out, catch up, you know, have a few drinks and just kind of have kind of a good time you know what I mean it's the holiday season and uh it's family members they haven't seen each other in a while and all this other stuff now uh as the night goes on though it does seem that whatever this mysterious illness that Polly had is starting to kind of spread to the other kids and what ends up happening is that it seems like it almost seems like the virus is affecting the youngest one first and then it's kind of jumping to the next oldest and the next oldest and the next oldest. At least that's what it seemed to me. I don't know. It's not really, uh, you know, it's not really explained to any extent. But at this point, so the kids just sign it. They just kind of feel like, you know, they're just kind of seem like, oh, you yeah, know, they're just kind of sick. They look a little bit pale, um, you know, and they look a little frowny and it's like they kind of irritable and cranky and stuff like that. So as I said, as you would, as most normal people would, oh, you know, whatever, Polly had it must have just been some little flu or something like that and now some of the other kids have it too and uh, so it's no big deal so they just kind of send them all to bed now the interesting there's like an interesting kind of interaction going between the sisters like Elaine and Chloe Chloe is the older sister and she's kind of like and like I said they don't the nice thing about this is that there's a lot of stuff that happens in this that's just revealed sort of organically and in the sense of you know, it's a real conversation that people would have that gives you insight into the character without there being like exp exposition or anything. You know, so just from a line or two, you get the idea that Chloe is kind of one of those, I'm gonna homeschool my kids, anti-vax kind of people, like just one of those like natural crunchy granola type women. Uh, so she's one of those. And her husband is kind of more like, he's just kind of going along with it. He's kind of a more fun loving type of dude. And uh, so they have that whole thing going on. And then Elaine and Jonah, Elaine is kind of seems, you know, she's the younger sister. She was obviously kind of rebellious as well because she was pregnant when she was, you know, a teenager. 
and uh, Chloe had, I guess, had a role in like raising her because it's implied that their mother was kind of a fuck up and that maybe Elaine is sort of following in her footsteps a little bit, like kind of being a party girl type of situation. Although she is responsible, you know, now she has three kids, like a teenager and two younger ones. And so it does seem like she's kind of come into her own now. She's obviously an adult, but she still has a little bit of that kind of like party girl sort of uh, thing. Jonah is kind of like, <laughs> he's kind of, it's funny because as his, like Casey, like later on in the movie, like calls him a knob, which he is kind of, because honestly, they're just going up there to hang out with family and hang out with the kids and open presents and have dinner and drink and have a good time. And he's basically up there trying to sell his brother-in-law on this new business venture that he's trying to uh, that he's trying to bring to fruition, like about Chinese traditional medicine. He's, you know, having his, he's teaching his daughter to speak Mandarin and he can't really like chill out and just relax. He's always kind of like, so there's some implication too that maybe he really needs some money uh, and he needs some investors in this new business idea that he has. And, uh, but Robbie is just like not really having it. It's like, look, it's the holidays. You know, why are you like coming to my house? And he doesn't say this, but the implication being that Jonah's trying, they're being very earnest and he's brought all this, <laughs> he brought like all this paperwork with him. And he's like, I really have to talk to you about this Chinese traditional medicine. And it's like, you know, when they're trying to have like a fun party dinner or whatever, he's always trying to like bring it up. So you can tell there's like a little bit of desperation there as well. There's also, um, and again, not, explicitly uh you know set up but there's also this real tension between jonah the stepdad and casey and particularly because uh their jonah's other like real natural biological daughter miranda is kind of like daddy's little princess whereas casey is just kind of like oh my wife's teenage daughter and it doesn't help that casey is kind of like, you know, rebel. She looks like, she's got like the Avril Lavigne kind of shit going on. Uh, so she's got like little purple streaks in her hair. And so she's kind of gothy looking. And she's kind of like a smart ass. She's kind of sarcastic, um, you know, in the way that she, I don't want to say she takes after her mom because her mom's not really like that. But you can see that she's kind of like the odd person out because, you know, it's like we have two couples here and then they both have two little, little kids and then she's like a teenager. So she can't really hang out with the little bitty kids and she can't really hang out with the adults either because she's not really old enough to drink or she's not really old enough to like participate in that. So she's kind of like, you know, she's kind of stuck in the middle and she's not having a good time. And honestly, what she's done, because she really, really did not want to come on this trip, is that she had actually secretly called a friend of hers because I guess the trip coincided with some big party that she was really dying to go to with her friends. And so she's really pissed at her mom for making her come to this thing instead of going and hanging out with her friends. So she actually secretly like calls her friend on the cell phone. It's just like, Hey, this is where I am. Come pick me up. And then we'll, you know, and you can drive me back to the party. So she's got this whole plan set up where she's going to leave. Now, as all of this stuff is being set up, I don't really want to call, like, the beginning of it, I don't know, I watched some other reviews of it, and some people thought, like, the, the first part was, like, a slow burn. I didn't really think it was all that slow, because you know that something bad is going to happen. You know this is a killer kid movie, um, and I think they do a really good job setting up all the character interactions and all of their you know, giving them some character development without being too heavy handed with it. Like I said, just you get a lot of idea of their backstories and things like that without much dialogue, just kind of the way they act with each other and just like little things, little throwaway lines, they they say. So I think that's a really good, I mean, it's just a really good setup. Um, and like I said, their interactions with each other are very, very natural. And even though it's a horror movie and obviously people are going to make maybe make some decisions that uh, are not the brightest, nothing in this struck me as like, why the fuck would you do that, you stupid idiot? It was it was all like believable, like coming from the characters. So as time goes on, yeah, like I said, the kids all start getting sick. Miranda, who is a little bit older, starts being like, I don't want to hang out with these little, little kids anymore because they're acting weird. And the way that they act weird, like sometimes they'll, like Polly keeps like banging on this xylophone just like all the time and he won't stop doing it and like staring off into space. But it's just, they're all acting like a little bit strange. And 
the parents, honestly, they just kind of feel like, oh, well, maybe they just have the flu and that, you know, maybe they're just a little bit ill and we're not really going to worry that much about it because they're having such a good time, you know, because it's the holidays and everything. So they just kind of like write it off and they write off Miranda saying, I don't want to hang out with the kids because they're acting weird. And Casey also noticing that the kids are acting kind of strangely. But as I said, no one really thinks that much about it, as you wouldn't if this happened in real life. Now, the first thing that happens that's kind of a portent of the carnage to come is that the kids are playing outside. You know, it's kind of like they got little sleds and snowballs and whatnot because it's winter time. And uh, Chloe comes out with a big tray full of hot tea for everybody because they're all sitting outside watching the kids. And uh, one of the kids very deliberately pushes the sled down the hill so that it whacks Chloe in the back of the legs and like she spills tea all over everybody. Now, obviously, you know, nobody thinks much of this. It's, oh, it was just an accident. It's not that big a deal. Um, although Jonah gets really, really mad about it because this tea spilled all over all the paperwork that he brought about his business idea. And he basically goes and spanks Polly, who was the kid that was, he thought, responsible for it, and then starts yelling at Casey, like, why weren't you watching them? And she's like, bro, it's, what the fuck? I didn't do anything. Like, I'm just, I'm just standing here, you know? So it was just an accident, like, calm down. So, you know, that kind of passes by. Uh, but there's other things that that are kind of like hinting at what's to come because they have a cat named Jinxie and obviously something bad's gonna happen to the cat, which you know as soon as you see it. Basically, there's a shot like inside this little tent. They have this little tent outside that they play in in the yard and uh, it kind of goes in there where the kids are sitting because Miranda's kind of hiding from the other kids because she thinks they're acting weird and there's uh, Jinxie's collar is in there. So you obviously know something bad happened to the cat, although they don't tell you what it is until later on. Um, so basically then they have this thing where they're trying to have this big, I assume it's Boxing Day, like I said, I think, because they all have the paper crowns on and they're having like a big meal and everything. And so they're all kind of trying to have a good time. And then all the kids start acting just like horrible little hellions. They're all just like whining and none of them will eat and they're like banging on stuff. And, and uh, you know, so the parents are trying to like deal with it and still trying to have a good time but it's just like not happening. So uh, eventually though, what ends up happening is that Chloe tries to go and get one of the kids to, you know, eat her peas or whatever, cause she's acted up. And uh, the kid basically just like whacks her in the head and like cuts her head open and then starts screaming and freaking out. So it's just kind of this whole situation. Dinner is ruined. All the kids are now just screaming and grabbing knives and doing all this crazy shit. So they're just like, okay, well we need to like separate these kids. So uh, Jonah takes his little princess Miranda upstairs who is just screaming her little head off. And uh, Robbie takes the other kids outside to play. Now, this is the stage where everything gets like really bad because then, uh, like I said, you have the foreshadowing of like the sled hitting Chloe in the back of the legs and like her spilling tea all over everything. But now you have something a little more calculated and a little more deadly, I guess, because what happens is they get Robbie and they're like, hey, let's go play. And they put him on the sled like face first and they push him down the hill. And then Nikki, one of the other kids, like pulls his little wagon in the path and has put like this big fucking rake or some shit in there. So it ends up that Robbie's head like hits this rake and like tears his fucking head open. So Robbie actually ends up dying like from the, cause it's head wound and everything. So they call, uh, you know, the emergency services, but because it's snowing and it's everything like that. So they tell them, well, we can't really get there. Like it's going to be a long time. So obviously everybody starts freaking out. Now, nobody really, that's kind of the great thing about, and I guess about killer kid movies in general is that, you know, what would you do if your precious child and through no fault of their own, really, because the implication in this, it's not super like over explained or anything like that. It looks like it's basically just a virus or a bacteria of some kind that's making them turn against their parents or making them turn against adults in general, because there's a couple shots of, you know, the kids are puking and then there'll be like um, shots of kind of like microorganisms briefly like inside the thing so it's obviously some kind of virus that's affecting their brains and like making them murderous and like i said that's pretty much the only explanation that you're given it, but the adults obviously don't know that and they don't it takes them a really long time 
to want to believe it because the first few terrible things that happen could be written down as like, oh, accidents, just kids being kids or they didn't really know what they were doing or they didn't know the gravity of it or anything like that. So nobody other than Casey, who's kind of seeing all this shit go down, she's the first one to sort of twig onto the fact that, hey, these kids are, there's they're not right and there's something wrong with them and there and we're all in danger but adult, obviously the adults don't believe her because like i said these are precious little children they're only like five or six years old and why would they do such a thing even if they were sick oh they're just sick it's you know it's fine they're just uh you know th that's why they're acting that way but they don't want to believe that the kids are actually like fucking with them and are actually like out to kill them uh but spoiler alert they absolutely are so after Robbie gets killed, Polly then goes to his dad and basically like slices his arm with a knife and everything, but still, they still don't want to believe it. Like I said, it's just they're little kids, they're sick, um, you know, they don't know what they're doing. But uh, at this point, Polly had done some shit too, where he was like up on the monkey bars, like it, that out in the yard, and uh, he looked like he was gonna fall, like, oh my God, I'm gonna fall off and everything like that. And like his mom starts to climb up there, but then he keeps like, you know, going just out of her reach and everything. So she has to keep like reaching across and reaching across. And the uh, the monkey bars are slippery because it's snowy and, you know, they're icy and stuff. And she ends up in a really nasty scene. Because <laughs> I honestly, that I honestly had a hard time watching. I've seen this movie like three times, I think at this point, it's really good. I mean, if you haven't seen it, uh, but there's this horrifying scene where She's reaching across trying to get the kid on the top of the monkey bars and she slips and her shin goes like in between the, like the ladder thing and she falls backwards and like her shin just goes Pah! and just like the bone just pops out. Oh, it's so nasty. And it's just and the sound effect that makes it. I was just like, Ugh! like every time it like it fucking gets me. But yeah, so she breaks her leg and Casey finds her and has to like take her in the greenhouse. And then Polly basically comes in there like trying to fucking murder them and all this other kind of shit. And then uh, they discover too that the kids have dragged Robbie's dead body like into the tent and are like playing with it. And it's just all this fucking crazy shit happens. Like I said, I don't know if I necessarily want to spoil everything that happens, but, but I mean, this came out in 2008, but I feel like a lot of people really haven't seen it. And it's kind of a shame because like I said, it's a really good, really effective horror movie. And I feel like it really flew under the radar. Like I said, even in its home country of the UK, it barely, I mean, it got a theatrical release, but it made hardly any money. And it seemed like it didn't do all that well. And it's kind of sad because this is like a really, really good movie. The child actors are amazing. Um, I like that they just kind of act like real kids. They're not, they don't come across as though they're acting. At the beginning of the movie, before they start getting sick, they're all just acting like real kids would act. It's very naturalistic. Uh, and the adults are as well, like the interactions between them. But the kids are just very naturalistic. And then once they start getting sick, I think the director made the really good choice, if it, w you know, if it was that, that the kids are not overplaying it. You know what I mean? They're not being like, rah, like evil, anything like that. Most of it is just like really subtle and it's really creepy. Like they're just kind of, they, they don't look good. They look kind of like they have the flu. Like they're kind of pale and their eyes are kind of sunken. And you know, sometimes they'll just be playing and then they'll just kind of like look off into space or something like that. So I think it was better to play it that way. It makes it much creepier. And you know, the, the buildup was like a lot eerier because the kids weren't over playing it or like overdoing it. Um, you know, they don't, once they turn evil, they don't really talk a lot, but it's creepy because when they do talk, they, you can tell that they're, like I said, very calculating in the sense that they're trying to lure their, their parents or the adults into a situation where they can kill them. Um, so, you know, when they have to, they'll be like, oh, where's mommy? Oh, I don't feel good and stuff like that. But it's like, they don't, you know, once they kill the, uh, once they start killing the adults, they don't talk about it they just kind of like sit there and like look you know what i mean so much much creepier than like a kid trying to go and way over the top because then it kind of shades over into like being funny uh this movie not funny <laughs> not really and uh honestly like i said i feel like a lot of american movies about killer kids would largely shy away from showing uh for example a five-year-old boy being impaled by a broken glass 
but this one, uh, this one goes there. So, uh, you know, pretty, pretty much everybody dies in this fucking movie, <laughs> including almost all of the children. So, uh, you know, in horrible ways, uh, you know, so, you know, an eight year old girl getting hit by a car and smashing into the fucking windshield. It's like, you know what I mean? So, so if you don't like to see violence against children in movies, even if the children are evil, um, you know, then maybe this is not the movie for you because it actually does uh, show a lot of these kids getting their comeuppance. But like I said, it's, it's, it's kind of a complicated thing because as I said, the kids, it's not their fault. They got, they got a virus, but that said, you still want the adults and, but you can also understand like why the adults are really reluctant to, I mean, you know, this is your five-year-old kid, like standing in front of you, like all cute and everything. And it's like, you, could you actually like kill them if you had to, if you thought the kids were going to kill you? And uh, so it does kind of like bring up this maybe uncomfortable uh, sort of situation, particularly if you're a parent. I mean, it's not, obviously it's not the same, uh, you know, it's, it's not the same heaviness for me because I don't have any kids, but if you did uh, and you watch this, you know, you can imagine yourself in that situation and just being like, man, could I, could I run my kid over with a car if I <laughs> thought that she was going to get, can I stab my, you know, five-year-old, my cher my little cherub of a five-year-old kid? Could I stab them in the face if I had to? You know what I mean? So this kind of like brings uh, a lot of that up. So it's very violent, uh, particularly toward the end. But, you know, like I said, a lot of kids get killed. And then at the end, uh, it kind of implies that, well, everybody's kind of fucked because it sort of opens it up to, uh, you know, this wasn't the only location where this happened. You know what I mean? So it's almost kind of like, I don't want to say it's like a zombie outbreak because they're not zombies. They seem like they still have their shit together. They just got sick and the sickness turned them murderous and calculating. Uh, and also... I don't want to know. I don't. This, I don't. I don't know if I'm just like if this is just me like seeing this, but it also kind of seemed like it made them a little bit of a hive mind type situation too, because they all seem to just they don't talk to one another about what their plan is going to be, but they seem to know like how to orchestrate like particular things. So I think maybe it does kind of maybe like connected them somehow like this virus or whatever. So, uh, so yeah, so as I said, this is a really, really good winter Christmassy New Year'sy, uh, horror movie that I feel like an, more people really need to see it because it's really, really well done, especially if you like killer kid movies. Easily one of the best killer kid movies I've ever seen just because it takes it very seriously and all the characters are believable. And all, and like I said, they'll do... The movie does some fucked up shit to kids. Like, it's not afraid to go there, which, you know, it's very ballsy, which uh, I actually really liked about it. I thought it was, you know, very brave of, <laughs> of it to go. A cat does get fucked up, but you don't see much of it. Uh, that bothered me more than the kids getting fucked up. I don't know what that says about me. But uh, but yeah, so if you're looking for something to watch around Christmas time and you haven't seen this one, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, it's actually really easy to get hold of. It's on Tubi for free. If you have Amazon Prime, uh, you can watch it on there for free. I think it's also on Vudu for free. So you can see this like pretty much everywhere without even having to pay for it, which, you know, quite a bargain uh, for as good a movie as it is. I mean, just like because it has like such a generic title, I totally never would have watched this unless I had, if I hadn't like seen someone else like on a list recommending it. And then I found it on Tubi and I was like, man, why, you know, and I think I've mentioned this before. Like, I think a lot of people have a misperception of Tubi is just like, yeah, it has a lot of horror movies, but a lot of them are shitty. Not so. Uh, there are actually a lot of shitty ones on there. I'm not going to say that, but there are actually a really lot of hidden gems in there. It's just really difficult because there's so many, you really have to like wade through and, you know, look for recommendations and stuff like that to find the ones that are worth watching. And this one definitely, definitely is. So as I said, if you're looking for a Christmas horror movie that you haven't seen before, uh, then check this one out and let me know what you thought about it in the comments. I really liked it a lot. As I said, I've seen it three times at this point and it's just, it's just a great, it's beautifully shot, beautifully acted, just a, just a really tense, fucked up, violent horror movie. Uh, you know, gotta love the killer kids. So uh, that'll do it for this Flickers of Fear, and I will see you guys on the next one. Bye.